Outrocast. Right on time there. How's it going there? Good. How are you? Great. The, the first thing I need to know is, are you Robert, Rob, Bob, Robbie? What's your preference there? Uh, Robbie. <laughs> <laughs> well, Robbie, I do appreciate you taking the time. You're one of those people where I've been listening to your music for decades, but I didn't necessarily know it was your music. Is that something that you mind or is that just, you know, the life and times of somebody who's had a publishing deal more of their life than not? No, I mean... I initially, when I was, you know, when I was a kid, I kind of had this sort of path in my mind of becoming an artist first and, you know, how sometimes best laid plans. Right. And uh, over the years, just it, it just it, when you're trying to get in the industry, or at least I remember when I was, it was sort of like I had the plan. But at the same time, I'm also a believer in, you know, roads show themselves. And mm -hmm. for whatever reason, my path showed itself where someone started showing me about you can also get songs on other people. And for someone like me. It was it was it made it fun to more fun in a lot of ways because I like a lot of different styles. But obviously, as an artist, you know, you tend to sort of kind of favor one as a singer. I probably do a little bit more like R&B and pop. But um, but I love I mean, I grew up on every it, literally a very to me, that was normal, you know, just growing up with like everything, loving from everything from the Beatles to Zeppelin to Black Sabbath, to the Stones to Earth, Wind and Fire to Stevie Wonder. To, it was all great. James Taylor just gone on steely and eagles i literally could go on forever and still a fan of a lot of you know today's stuff well as well um and so, but along the way i was sort of shown the way you can write songs for other people and that opened some doors which eventually led to my record deal mm -hmm. and i never really stopped writing for other people maybe maybe at when i was first put out my first record because there was you know it kind of took up all my time uh, but after that you know i just I've always sort of written and produced for other people. So I understand if someone doesn't know that I wrote that song, but it's, it's kind of fun when someone does find out, they're like, wow. And that's a perfect example with it. Speaking, I'm going probably going ahead of you, but uh, the David Lee Roth mm -hmm. stuff, which is really fun because I do love rock and I grew up on a lot of rock, even though my voice doesn't sound that way. And even though that's not what I did as an artist, I still loved it. And it was, uh, you know, it's always fun working with cats like him. You know, he was, he's a rock star. I definitely have more questions about that. But in your case, you answered something which I was going to ask when you said, well, I was always writing for other artists, except when I was busy with my first album, per se. I find that there's kind of two schools of people who I call co-writers, if that's an acceptable term. And one of them is uh, I got my cuts. I'm kicking back. I'm not doing anything ever again. And then the other stuff, wait. I'm a songwriter. This is my craft. I write songs. So are you still super, super active? Because the Disney world, the R&B and pop worlds, you it looks like your credits never stopped, per se. But there's some people you'll find who they wrote their 300 songs and the publisher is just still shopping them 20 years later. You know, it's interesting. I've, I've known certain artists that seem like it's, at a certain point they sort of left they kind of looked at it as this is what I grew up on and today's music. I just don't understand. I, I know, I know, you know, friends of mine and, and people that I'm huge fans of as well over the years, but I've always been, in fact, I always try to find something that I like about whatever it is. So I'm always been a radio flipper in the car. And still when I go in the car, I'm listening to everything and I'm constantly flipping around, but I, I'm a fan of today's, you know, particularly a lot of the productions are amazing these days. There's a lot of great stuff. So yeah, I never, I never stopped doing it. And it's, uh, you know, it, it's fun. I love, I love the process. You know, there's certain, I've gotten to a point now where I don't chase every carrot is what I call it, which is that sort of when you're a songwriter, that tends to be a sort of hired gun mentality, which is that, oh, this project is looking for a thing and we need to do this and, or some artists just signed a deal with this. And there's a lot of those that you, over the years, you can kind of get into this habit as a songwriter of just sort of ch chasing all of them, you know, and, and I've got to a point now where I'm, I'm more particular and probably over the last 10 to 15 years, made more of a living uh, working in TV and film and, and mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. There's just been more things you kind of just sort of take what, you know, what, what comes your way. But at this point, I'm also just sort of trying to find stuff that I really have fun with. And, you know, a couple of years ago, I had done an album that was in a style that was uh, it was, I'm not sure exactly what to call it, but it was a song called I See Red that, that actually became this huge viral thing, which a lot of people are just, I can't believe you wrote that. And I just sort of go, well, I don't, I never looked at music as this sort of one thing. And so when you're a songwriter, right. 
it's really fun, particularly when you get those projects that let you kind of like, you know, like all of a sudden you're pulling out of the slide and, you know, you get to get, do that. And a lot of people just like, I didn't know you did that. It's just like, well, I never, I don't know. Today's, the, the songwriters that I meet today, a lot of them sort of come from a, a certain thing that they do and, and it's great and they're amazing at it. And I try to learn from everybody I work with and, you know, always, always grow. That's the key thing is that you're always growing, always trying to learn something and listen to the stuff. I mean, I understand, I guess, if some people listen and they kind of go, that's, I don't like it. Or, I mean, that's a subjective, you know, it's a personal choice. I, I still do like a lot of it. And some of it, I gravitate more than others, but it's, it's the fun part. You know, it's, it's be, I love things that are done well, you know, but it doesn't matter what style. And I love a challenge too. If someone comes in and says, we needed this for that, or it's gotta be some classical this or that, or for some trailer, or that. it's just kind of a fun challenge, you know, cause there's a part of you kind of going, I know I could do this. You know? <laughs> well, the key is you're a musician, you're a songwriter, and that's what you do. It's not one of these, uh, yeah, I'll send the hook to that person and we'll see what happens. You're actually in the room with the people. And most people don't realize that this song was made over a one to four day period you did it, it's done, you moved on to the next one. So it might be something that they live with the, for the rest of their lives and listen to all the time. But you, it's it was a gig, you did it, you moved on and you did plenty more that month or that year, really. You're not wrong. <laughs> it's just, it's the nature of the beast, you know? I mean, I remember yeah. when, when I used to be gone, you know, promoting and doing a lot of that stuff, I was putting out my own records. You know, there is that part, there's something really fun about that. now. One thing you said, I don't know if it's always the case, that even with David, I, again, I'm jumping ahead, I guess, but um, you're not always in the room. That's not always the case. Sometimes someone will give you a thing or you'll come up with a start and you'll bring it in like with David. And I'm sure at some point you'll, I think you do a podcast just about Dave or something, or I think. I, I yeah, me, me and Steve Roth, no relation to David Lee Roth, okay. <laughs> have a podcast that it's, it's not the most a uh, geeky podcast about David Lee Roth, but it comes pretty close. And we love the A Little Ain't Enough album. And I know you have two cuts on there. So I have a lot of questions about that, if you'll entertain those those questions, of course, per se. That's fun. I mean, right when you wrote, when you talk about that album, I go, yeah, that was really, really fun. So I, I look forward to it, yeah. It, it definitely stands out in your discography because if I look at the major artists, Babyface and Earth, Wind and & Fire and Jessica Simpson and David Lee Roth, and you go, Okay, there's a story here. But you mentioned you're not always in the room with people. That's something that I've heard about a lot of times that, yes, a song is started and then somebody hears it in their publisher's office or their label's office and they go, would you like to finish it? Or what do you think of that? Are your two songs, now? it's two songs I believe on A Little Ain't Enough. Yeah. That's correct. Okay. Are both of those things that were pre-written and found his way to him or one of them was? No, it, 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 it started with a, a mutual friend of ours, uh, Keith Olson. Uh, oh, yeah. Amazing rock producer. Rick away. Springfield, lots of great records. We lost him a year ago. Yeah, God, so many. It's, the discography just goes forever. He was an amazing cat. And uh, he had introduced me to David. I'm pretty sure that's how I was trying to think of it yesterday when, you, when I saw your email. Uh, I think he had introduced us. And the first time we got together, I went to David's house. And it was, you know, it's a blast because I grew up listening to Van Halen too. I remember being in club bands, you know, cover bands when they were first starting to really, really take off. And sure. it was, you know, I mean, they're, they're like, that's, that's, it was a certain kind of rock star thing that it's, it's not the same today. It doesn't feel the same, but, but maybe it's also the perspective of it. I don't know. But uh, um, so we got together and he had had the first song was Shoot It. Yes. That was one of the songs on the record. And he had had Shoot It. And I think, God, it's a little bit gray in my memory, so I may get this wrong, but I know I know he had the track. I didn't have no, anything to do with the, the music. He had the track, and I think he had some melodic ideas, uh, but he sort of said, why, you know, why don't you take this, and, you know, mess around with it and come back and, you know, see what happens. So I think he, we talked about it a little bit, and he might have had some other words. I just, it, quite honestly, I just don't quite remember, <laughs> but but, uh, but I know he had that, the track was his track, and um, and so I took it wrote some lyrics to it and then uh, came back to his house. And he, he was a very memorable cat to work with just because he's, he's, he's David Lee Roth. <laughs> he's, yeah. like one, he's, he's one in a million, you know, he's just, a, oh, just, a, just an amazing guy and he's super fun. But I just remember being uh, 
Yeah, I just never, there's one thing he said to me when I came back with the lyrics that I just never forget. Whereas, cause I really didn't know exactly, I wrote what I thought would be right for him. You know, I don't know how much of it I wrote. I think I had a lot of the hook and maybe the verses too. I, I quite honestly don't totally remember. Yeah. But I, I was telling him about it in a kind of like, not apologetic manner, but he thought he saw it as that. Or, I don't know, it's all relative, but I was sort of saying, hey, listen, you know, this is this thing I have, you know, if it's not cool, I'll, I'll rewrite it again or I'll, I'll tweak it or, you know, what have you. And he just, he looked at me at one point, he's just like, you know, cause he just, he just didn't understand my kind of, you know, just trying to be really- Diplomatic. Overly, overly diplomatic, perhaps, <laughs> I don't know. You know, it was just my personality type compared to his, which is a very sort of, he's got a large personality, no doubt, you know? And he looked at me, he goes, did your mother hit you as a child? <laughs> Never forget that. And we just started laughing. Up. I just started laughing. It was it's just such a classic line. He just has a line for everything. And, and he's, he's a great dude. So um, got, we finished that one up. And I wasn't there when he sang it. I, I think at that point, the next thing I did was I really enjoyed working with him. He's a great guy and he's super, super fun. And so I just went back and I'm like, you know, I want to come up with something that kind of reminds me of like what I just like my favorite, you know, David Lee Roth and Van Halen, that era, it just, just, just my take on it, you know? And so I started Little Ain't Enough without him. And I was working at the time I was, uh, I had access to a studio because I was assigned to MCA Publishing. They had a studio. So mm -hmm. I went down with a band and I cut Little Ain't Enough, but it wasn't at that time. I just called it living in luxury. And I sang, I did the basic track, not the one that's on the record. He redid it, you know, obviously Bob Rock and did an amazing job, but um, but so I did the basic track and then I put a scratch vocal where I was singing the melodies. And then I, but during that hook line, I would say living in luxury, which I think still ends up in the line, but that was my yeah. whole, my whole thing was the whole thing was called living in luxury. And then he, he took it and I sent it to him. I can't remember if I heard back or if I, maybe he just goes, Oh, this is great, man. You know, but you never know in those situations, like maybe he'll take it or maybe it won't make it. And I don't think I heard back from him for a while. And then he worked. There's a couple of producers I remember he worked with on the record, but I don't know. I think he ended up doing the whole record with Bob Rock, but I remember getting yes. a call from Bob Ezrin, who's another, you know, just like giant as far as, you know, producers. I mean, just, just did amazing records with Pink Floyd. And you Kiss. On, and on, yeah. and on and on and on and on. It was just, you know, flabbergasted. You get a call. He's like, you know what? I'm working with David. We're thinking about cutting that song. And I was just, wow. I was thrilled because I always loved the song but you don't have control over that, you know? And yeah. so then I didn't hear from them for quite a while. And Are you talking about months or weeks? Oh, I'm sure it was months. I'm sure it was months because the next thing I know, I think I heard from David that they did the album with Bob Rock and that, you know, it could be the first single or something, which was just mind blowing because it's just, I mean, it was exciting, you know, for obvious reasons. I was still doing the artist thing at that point where I was recording my own album. So it was really, I always enjoyed playing those two roles. I always thought that was really fun to have this kind of song out and then, you know, something totally what you wouldn't expect. And, uh, and it became the same, but they did the whole album with Bob Rock and he's another hero. I mean, that kept yeah. the records just so they're so big i just when that record came out i was just like god dang i was just like blown away how huge it was and then dave he called me i think we we hung out a few times like i think he invited me to a karaoke thing one night or something it was so much fun he's a great cat you know he's he was just a really just he's he, he's good people man you know and he was just real supportive and and uh just made that's that whole experience was a great one that's about all my so a lot of people that I speak with as a recovering music industry person that occasionally helps out a, a songwriter or two, you'll find out when somebody writes for an album, they, they have two cuts on the album and they really wrote 15 songs for it. In your case, did you really go two for two on that album? Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. But you, you go also, yeah, you're right about that. Um, um, I'm, well, yeah, it, you, you never do know. You're right. Sometimes you're in there and you're in. I think I was sort of higher. That's why I said that kind of hired gun mentality, which is like always think, try to get the singles or, you know, and, and, and there is an element of luck. I mean, who are we trying to kid? There's, there's always luck in everything in life. There's an element of whether you call it luck or fate or what have you. But, um, but yeah, that was, I was happy about it. No doubt, you know, cause you're right. There are some things you write a whole lot of songs and only end up with a few, but that when you're a writer for a publisher, it is your job to try to write the singles. No one really wants the album cuts. Sometimes they end up being album cuts, but 
And in this day and age where it's like, as a songwriter, if you're work, if you're making your living writing on albums, you better have a single or you're probably not gonna make any, it's a different day. People don't really buy albums the way they did. And you know, you know the game. For sure. So a lot of times another pattern is when an artist cuts your song, it's a hit, it's a single and all that. The next album they come calling because they go, hey, re let's replicate that success. And then the other artist goes, I did that before. I'm not doing that again. I'm a creative artist. Did you get any correspondence or reach outs for the next album for your filthy little mouth in 94? I, I didn't. But I understand what you mean, because I remember after my first record, I, I had that kind of mentality too. I'd work with a certain production team who were great, uh, Alex Sackin and Phil Thornley, but, yeah. but when I did my next record, I, I just sort of wanted you just, because like you said, you, you've been there and you love that and it's great for what it is, but you sort of feel like I want to try something new. Sometimes you go back, I mean, I never take it personal. It's not like that at all. It's just, um, yeah. Yeah, you get the call or, or you don't, but yeah. I mean, I don't know. I no, I don't, yeah, I don't think I, I don't think I heard from him again, but I remember uh, hearing him on Howard Stern or something and Howard was you know, like, yeah, Robbie Nell, you know, that guy that just blah, blah, blah. And he was kind of, you know, doing his Howard Stern, making fun of me, which I love. I don't, I don't care. I don't take myself too seriously. And he's like, well, no, man, I met him and his wife. He's, he's cool, man. He's great. You know, it was really cool. I just, I've always had fun memories and, when I see him on TV, David Lee Roth, the thing that's so amazing about him, aside from the music, is just that he's, he's, I just can't believe how, how rapid fire he, he has some crazy, amazing line to say about everything. And I wonder sometimes, is he improving them or does he just have this endless supply of, you know, wonderful one, one liners? I mean, he must know them, he must have worked them out. I mean, he's just, it never ends. And his energy is like he's burned so bright. It's a, he's an amazing guy. Yeah, that's for sure. I I always thought it was like a Henny you Youngman. Like, like my Christmas cup. I don't know. I just noticed it's a Christmas. That's cup. that's a cooler one than mine. Mine is from the Woody Guthrie Museum, but I guess it's cheaply made because the the lettering is washed <laughs> off. Uh, be careful cup. with your coffee cup. I guess that's the lesson here. But <laughs> but I figure that Diddley Roth, he's kind of basically a stand up comedian. The word was when he mm -hmm. started that he had an act similar to Ollie Joe Prater from the comedy store where mm. he would be, be doing one-liners between Van Halen songs and that rubbed people, some people the wrong way. And I see that there's not a big difference between say him and classic Rodney Dangerfield, classic Henny Youngman, et cetera. <laughs> it's a very borscht belt kind of thing. And the singing was secondary in a way to the personality per se. But the vibe I'm getting is that he was like that one-on-one -on -one as well. He was, I mean, it wasn't like, you know, he can turn it on to many different, you know, he can turn it up to 10 and, you know, it wasn't always like that, not, yeah. not that intense, but uh, another interesting thing, I remember it just coming to me that he, that he said, which is, it makes sense, but, but it's just an interesting, we were just talking about vocal styles, mm -hmm. and I was, you know, and when I did my rough vocal, I was pretend, that's what I kind of try to do is try to channel and get into what I feel they would sing, and it's my, yeah. you know, version of it so it clearly is not the same thing but you know just the isms you know everybody's got their things that they do and he's got a million um mm -hmm. and, and uh and, and he goes you know what man ironically i always thought of myself as an r&b singer yes and, but that's what comes out and, and i just thought what a trip you know just like but i get it in a, in a in a weird way i get it it's just that but from his perspective it's all that's the fun part about music and how we kind of like, we're all, we all take from everything and then it, we kind of redo it and it comes out in our own, you know, you know like when I did Little Lane Enough, I was what I thought he would, but he probably heard it just like, well, I don't know about that. And, he, and they, they flipped it. I mean, the original track was, was cool, but I mean, they, they definitely did a brilliant. Another thing that I'm curious about from the songwriter's perspective of, and, and career overall from what you do is, Outside collaborators, when they have one hit, they usually have other people sniffing around going, he did that for them, then he could do that for me. Like somebody along the lines of, say, Jack Ponte or Desmond Child. It, yeah. it, that's not the kind of music they wanted to make because we know that Desmond Child came from the disco world. And that ultimately has very little to do with all the power ballads and things that he was writing in the late 80s, early 90s, per se. In mm -hmm. your case, because you wrote A Little Ain't Enough, or co-wrote it, you know, 
technicality, legal, legality sake right there. Did you have other people sniffing around going, I want that for me? Well, I don't remember someone saying they want that because that was so in his kind of, you know, David Lee Roth meets Van Halen kind of genre. So I don't know that people wanted that. But I remember bumping into John Bon Jovi at, uh, at, a, at a recording studio. And he's like, man, that's so cool. I heard that you did that thing. And I had met him in Sweden doing some, we were doing some, some, he was, I think, on tour, but he also we were doing some TV show and met him at the thing. And and uh, and he said, man, we, we got to get together. And he like, we did a little co-write with him and Southside Johnny. And it was just, but it came as a result of that. So mm -hmm. he wasn't, believe me, it wasn't like Southside Johnny wanted that at all. But it was just that idea that kind of like, I dig it. You, you, you like a lot of music. And I do. I never really sort of thought of it as, you know, only this style or I just, I literally, it, still to this day, like on my iPod, it, you know, it's, it's very vast, including a lot of jazz too. I, I don't know. I, it's, it's all, you know, if it's done well, I'm, I love it. You know? So it sounds like, to recap what we were talking about before, when you get into the room with the person, you're just able to adapt to that personality or that genre, work on that, and then not take it personally if that's not what you're into. Because I, I find a lot of artists go, this is what I do, and they fight the process. No, I'm, I'm the opposite. I mean, you know, I also grew up being a, a lot of, one of the things I did was a lot of session guitar playing. And so when you're doing that, you sort of have to be able to jump genres. You know, it's not like, well, I only play rock or this and that. I mean, you sort of on some level, that's the fun of it. You want to be able to kind of do a little bit of, you know, something. But yeah, I just, it's not a question of taking it personal. I just, if someone called me to do some punk rock thing, you know, some really, you know, just that would be, I'd love it. But the difference, I noticed some people that they sort of, they see it from a kind of like a, a place of emulation, like, oh, and, and they grab some aspect of the music and they think, oh, like for example, and nothing against any jazz cab, but it's like if some jazz player hits a, a jazz guitarist hits a fuzz and he kind of goes, I play rock and you go, no. <laughs> yes, you're hitting a fuzz pedal. Yes, it's a distorted sound. You got to understand like where something's coming from. So if I'm playing right. a part that's really, really bonehead, it's not just when I say bonehead, I mean, some, just some just really, really basic, I should have said. Um, Cowboy chords, or you're talking about basic one, four, five stuff. It could be, stuff. If it's rocking, it might be just, just yeah, just, it might just be something that basic. But the pocket and the feel you put it in, that's what separate that's what tells you if a person kind of gets where that's coming from the feel the sound and just knowing where to and getting into the the, the just just the whole vibe of the music like i listen to zeppelin or, or i listen i was a huge hendrix fan and i think zeppelin i think it's funky i mean people think of course. Funky, but listen to some of the groove and there were bonham's laying it back and i just i see it all as sort of not as separate things and if i'm in a style i'm going to try to be true to what i think makes that style feel the way it does not just the kind of like, oh yes, they use a blah, blah, blah synth to do that. Yet it's more, it's, that's not the- So you're a feel guy. guy, not a gear yes. guy. Oh, not a what guy? Not a gear guy. No, uh, big time, yes. I definitely feel first, yeah. I mean, abs absolutely, absolutely. But, yes. but the era, I'm sorry to cut you off here. The era that you came up in, you had to know how to play. You could not fake it unless you were Sonny Bono per se. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so you came up when you had to play and you cut your teeth before you had the publishing deal per se. Yeah. Did you easily and co comfortably embrace digital technology versus the analog and the tape? Well, I mean, when I first was first recording, there was, it was tape, you know. Um, I mean, I can't, I mean, it was, it was like, you know, 16 track, 24 track analog, you know, for the longest time. You did, yeah. Have, even in my home studio, I used to have a you know, 24 track uh, analog. Um, I think it's all good. I think Quincy Jones, I think once wrote it's, you know, gear is a tool. Uh, and, and so it's, it's really how you use it. And I remember doing a record one time with, uh, with uh, George Michael's uh, engineer, guy named Chris Porter, who's amazing. And mm -hmm. He was working on it was a digital console. I think it was Sony Digital and or digital. It was just everything was so digital. I was really scared that 
it was gonna sound, you know, sort of a little too slick or pristine or something about it. And it was actually one of the warmest records I'd ever worked on, just the way he made it sound. It's all relative. It's how you use what you have. I am a fan of, you know, when people analog, even nowadays, a lot of times like mastering engineers, they'll go through digital or they'll go through uh, you know, analog processing to sort of get some of that back. And there's, it is, it is a great thing, but I'm not sort of one of these, oh, it's got to be this, or I've got to cut it on that. But, you know, you do hear some, like a lot of rock cast, like they'll cut their drums on analog and then they'll transfer it over to Pro Tools. It makes sense because the tape saturation is a different thing, but now they have plugins for God knows everything. Yeah. Totally. So you've been so generous with talking about all this, what you're up to now at the moment, session work, writing for other artists still, any particular things you want to plug that you're working on right now? Um, you know, right now this, during, you know, this, while well, we've all been sort of more in the house these last couple of years with COVID, um, or at least a year and a half or something, I've been, yeah. I, I finally decided to do another record on myself. So that was a uh, fun, you know, and, a lot of work because I sort of had to decide what it is that I wanted to do. And my, where I kind of like feel most natural as an artist is pop art and being the things I grew up with, whether it be mm -hmm. Earth, Wind and Fire or Michael Jackson or all, you know, that kind of, I just love all Quincy and, and, and all, just those records to me, I, that's just, there's a, they're feel good records, you know? And to me, um, that was kind of the point of this record. So that's, I guess what I'm going to plug is not done yet. But, uh, but it will be soon, but that's been kind of where I'm putting most of my time. And then the most recent thing before that was the, uh, I see red, the uh, ELAO stuff, which was this freak thing that got kind of big from a movie, a Netflix movie, 365 DNI, which, which I haven't seen, but I, you know, but I, I was really happy to be just part of that ride in the band, everybody loves now, it was, it was just, it's been really fun working on something that's so different from what I usually, that's the only thing is that sometimes for example, if you're doing a lot of stuff for Disney, and there were years that I did a lot of stuff for Disney, and I'm grateful. Yeah. My daughter, my daughter was 11 at the time, so it was really, it was something to share in a really kind of magical way. It was great, you know, just being part of that whole, uh, that whole thing. But then at a certain point, a lot of people know you for that, so you do start getting those. That's the kind of stuff that comes your way, and it's great, and there's nothing wrong with it. But I like a lot of different stuff, and that you know, like doing things like the icy red it was really fun to just sort of this whole revenge song <laughs> it was very sort of cathartic to break out of some of that but you know um and then working on i was really lucky to get the tmz doesn't really have a theme song per se the tv show but i ended up doing that what they call the sort of theme song oh that bumper that comes in and out of the commercials is yours yeah, yeah. i did not know that I, again, this echoes the thing I said at the beginning. Well, I was just say, was, co, co, using your point earlier, uh, co-written with my, my partner, Matthew Gerard. Yeah. Yes, and, and Matthew, <laughs> Matthew has one of my favorite cuts that he doesn't remember writing, I'm sure. There, uh -huh. there is this writer camp, if you don't mind a little sidebar of the story. I worked on the management team for this artist, Mike Doty. He was the singer of Soul Coughing. And, mm -hmm. you know, they did really well. They fused kind of jazz and hip hop with a rock thing. So there were some big hits. He eventually goes solo. He's on Dave Matthews's label for a couple of records. And so Mike Doty has this demo of the song that Matthew co-wrote with Dan Wilson, the semi-sonic guy who's written Adele and everyone's songs and Nikki Six or Motley Crue. Wow. And I think it was called like Late Night at the Taco Bell. It's a, like a really bad song. But Mike <laughs> Doty heard the chorus and went, that's a hit. And the, the chorus was na na nothing. And he basically heard and went, this is a hit. Let's take out the part about Nikki Six rapping because Nikki Six actually raps the demo. I can send this to you oh if you want. And then Mike goes, this chorus is so strong. I'm going to turn it into a song. So we then had to negotiate the splits of going, mm -hmm. well, the song exists but we're only using the chorus. And yeah. I think it was like a 50% to the original writers and then 50% to him. Yeah. Uh, so I, I guess that that yields the lesson of you're not always in the room. <laughs> it's true. That stuff does happen, but yeah. So, you know, doing those types of things, that's, those have been great, you know, just to those kind of things, they, they pay a lot of the bills, you know, and, and that kind yeah. of stuff. And, and, themes to a lot of the Disney shows and that kind of stuff, which is, 
you know, I've been very, very fortunate, you know, worked hard, but at the same time, very, very fortunate. And these days I just, I try to grab things and do work on things that they're fun. I mean, it's sort of a, you know, I love working. I think on some level I'll, I'll always do something just because it's, it's sort of it's the mind always wants to create something, but uh, I'm definitely pick and choose more, but those kind of situations where you have chances to write theme songs for TV shows, you sort of can't, turn down you never know which shows are going to go some never get picked yeah. up have you but those are ones that you know i'm grateful for very grateful actually so it sounds like all is good in aside from the state of the world and <laughs> the pandemic yeah. and the liquor shortage that's now pressing in different parts of the u.s and wars and aside from that in the yeah. music business, you're doing fine yeah exactly <laughs> Well, yeah. I can't thank you enough for not only your time, but the years of great music. And I do look forward to hearing that record of yours when it's actually done and ready for public consumption. Thanks. Yeah. And I'll, when I next talk to Matt, I'll bring up that song. You mentioned. If, if he does not have the demo on hand, let me know and I'll. Okay. And, and I think it's actually called Date from Hell or Date Night from Hell, something <laughs> like that. Awesome. That's a great title. Love it. All right. Man. Thanks, <laughs> Thanks, Robbie. Have a great rest of the day. Take care. Bye. Outro cast.